What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Kicker Scuba and Marina. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor. Hit this little subscribe button right here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys are going to be notified every time we upload new content. Now we are on chapter four in our series of the SSI Open Water Scuba Diver Program. And if you've been following along, you'll know I've got to put the disclaimer out there. Please do not use these videos to learn how to scuba dive. You need to seek out your local SSI Open Water Instructor to learn the proper ways to dive. What we would like for you to do is to use these videos as a simple study guide to help you pass your SSI open water exam. So with that being said, let's jump into chapter four of the SSI open water diver program. So the first thing that we're going to talk about in chapter four is a dive buddy and the value of a dive buddy. There's three main reasons you should always have a dive buddy. First and foremost, it's simply fun. You need somebody there to share this experience with. I know personally, I get to dive with my oldest daughter and she's probably one of my favorite dive buddies out there. I get to share my experience with her and see her grow as a diver. Number two, it's practical. I don't know about you, but dive tanks tend to be pretty heavy for me, and sometimes they can be very difficult, especially if you got heavier steel tanks, to get these cylinders on and try to get them up on your back. And over the years, my back has really suffered because of it. However, it's practical to have a dive buddy who can pick it up and hold it in place or to steady it while you help get your gear on. So it's very practical. And then of course, number three, and probably the most important reason to always have a dive buddy, is for the safety factor. They're there in the event that something goes wrong, they can assist you to solve a problem. So dive buddies in my book are definitely a must on every single dive. So the next thing that we're going to look at, of course, is planning dives and why they're so important. And there's a phrase that I want you to remember, plan your dive and dive your plan. Now, this is not a new phrase. This has been around for a very, very long time. Even back in the 1980s, we used to recite this over and over. Plan your dive and dive your plan. It's so important that you and your dive buddy come up with an objective for the dive. What is the sole purpose that you're going to be here? Are you going spear fishing? Are you going to be doing underwater photography? Or in this case, you guys taking the SSI open water program, you're learning how to scuba dive. There needs to be an objective of the dive that you and your buddy are going to agree on. And there's several things throughout a plan that you need to evaluate and make sure that you're going to be safe to dive. One, check the weather. Is it going to be safe for you to go out and dive? Two, check yourself. Are you in the proper position to dive? Three, check your equipment. Is your equipment going to be good and ready to dive? And are you familiar with your buddy's equipment as well? You and your buddy should be familiarized. That way, in the event something happens, not only can you manipulate your gear, you can also manipulate your buddy's gear as well. And then, of course, you make your final decision. Are we going to dive as a buddy team? Once you've made that decision, now you need to determine how you're going to plan out that dive. Here shortly, we're going to learn all about the dive tables and how they actually help us plan dives. And I'm also going to show you how you can plan a dive using a dive computer as well. So now that you and your dive buddy have your dive planned out, it's time to go diving. And there's two main types of entries that we do. We have a shore base entry and we have a boat entry. Now boat entries are several different methods. We can do a roll in entry or a roll back entry. We can do a controlled seated entry. We can even do a giant stride or my personal favorite, gravity works every time. That's where you just splash in. And of course shore entries are a little bit easier because you don't have to go across a boat. However, if you're walking in say through the surf, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to contend with. One, you've got the splashing waves coming in. You may have an undertow trying to pull you out and there's a certain procedure that your SSI open water instructor is going to teach you so that not only are you doing it efficiently you're also staying safe while getting in the water as well. Now after the dive you're going to have to learn how we get back out of the boat and it's typically just going to be the reverse of whatever you did to get in. However let's say that you're getting back onto the boat there's several different methods based off the vessel you're getting on and also based off the ladder system they use. Some dive boats will have what I love the fin ladders where you can actually walk up with your fins. Some will make you actually require you to take your fins off prior to climbing up the ladder and some will even have you take your gear off before you exit and climb up and that way you can climb up without all that heavy weight on and then simply pull your gear up. But you need to check with your local charter system and see what they prefer or how they require you to get on and off their boat as well. Shore entries are pretty much just a reverse. If you walk in, of course, you're going to walk out carrying your fins with you. But each destination is going to be a little bit different and you just need to evaluate those conditions when you're at the dive side. 
Now that we've made our entry into the water, the first step, of course, is doing a proper weight test. Now, maybe you've been used to diving in fresh water and this is your first time in salt water or vice versa. We need to do a proper weight test and weight tests really don't take up that much time, just a matter of a few seconds. In short, you're going to ditch all the air out of your BC. You're going to take a normal breath here at the surface and hold that breath and you should float around eye level as you begin to to exhale, you're going to descend down into the water column. Now, if you do need to add a couple extra pounds, only add about two pounds or two pound increments. Don't try to overweight yourself just to go down because you'll learn that if you get too overweighted, you're going to use too much air in your BC to get neutrally buoyant and that air could be used up for you breathing versus getting you neutrally buoyant. So we never ever want to be overweighted. Now, once you and your buddy are underwater, you can give the OK symbol. You can look to see if you've got any bubbles leaking anywhere. And and if all is good, then you're going to make a slow descent down to whatever depth you're going to. Make sure you equalize on the way down and make sure that you and your buddy stay within a contactable distance, if you will. Doesn't mean you got to hold hands. You just need to be close enough to your buddy that you can render aid in, say, an emergency or if your buddy needs assistance in one way, shape, or form. Now, as you descend, I personally like to go ahead and go horizontally trimmed here. So I don't go down feet first, and a lot of times I won't even go down head first. As soon as I go underwater, I start to get in that horizontal, trimmed out, swimming, diving position. And I want to keep that position throughout the dive. Like we talked about in Chapter 2, it's going to help give us the best breathing efficiency that we can possibly have. It's also going to help us keep streamlined as we move through the water column so that we get rid of all the resistance that we possibly can. That's also going to help conserve some the air in your tank as well. You want to stay neutrally buoyant. We don't want to brush up against anything. We don't want to damage any ecosystems or anything like that. And we always want to be cautious of where our fins are. So a lot of times we'll try to keep our fins up above us slightly and we can do different kick patterns to help prevent any type of leg cramps and even to prevent ourselves from getting wore out while we're underwater. Now, once we've breathed down to about two thirds of our breathable gas, then of course we want to signal to our buddy, hey, it's time to go up and perform a three minute safety stop. Now, a lot of shallower dives, the entire dive itself is a safety stop. And if you're doing no decompression dives, then safety stops in themselves are not even required. However, we still like to perform them just for added conservatism. And a safety stop is basically a stop at 15 feet for three minutes, just to bleed off a little bit of extra nitrogen before we come up. And like I said, no decompression dives where safety stops are not required. We still like to do them just for that added conservatism, but if the whole dive itself is within the safety stop range, there's absolutely no trouble in you just coming on up to the surface. Now that we finished our dive and we're out of the water, we want to make sure that we thoroughly clean our gear and we get it stowed away where it needs to be, but it's also important to log your dives. And you should be logging every dive. It doesn't matter if it's in a swimming pool, if it's in a local lake or a local quarry, or even out in your tropical Caribbean ocean. You should always be logging your dives. There's so many great things that can come from logging your dives. You can document your experience underwater. You can also document if you had any emergencies or even if you had an equipment malfunction, it's there to help remind you that, hey, maybe I need to get this fixed before I go diving again. But you can also log two other things that are very important. One is your sac rate, which is your surface air consumption rate. And the second is your RNV rate, your respiratory minute volume. And your SSI open water instructor is going to go over how to calculate your sac and RNV. That's going to help work you down to a lowerable sac rate, but it's also going to help you plan dives in the future to make sure you have an adequate gas source to make those dives. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the calculations and the math and the science behind diving, look at the SSI science of diving course. It's a great class. It's an academic only course. And to be honest, it's going to make you a better diver and even a more educated diver as well. So guys, that's going to do it for chapter four of the SSI open water program. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helps you out passing your SSI open water final exam. If you do have any questions, drop me a comment down below and I'll try to answer it the best I can. Once again, guys, please do not use these videos to learn how to properly dive. You need to seek out your SSI open water scuba instructor to do that. Simply use our videos as a study guide to prepare you for the SSI final exam. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off today. Take care. God bless. And I'll see you in the next video.